Previously, I have covered the topic of escort carriers. These plucky little ships were the quickest way to get functional aircraft carriers, even if they were slow and unarmored. They were, however, not the only option or idea for a quick way to build carriers. There were also the light carriers, conversions of cruiser hulls, or other relatively fast warships. And, for that matter, the Royal Navy's light fleet carriers, but those aren't conversions. These light carriers, built by several navies, would prove to be effective ships that gave good service, though they weren't without flaws of their own in the case of the conversions. There were the traditional conversion issues of being inefficient compared to a purpose-built design. And in the case of the American cruiser conversions, there were issues with slim flight decks and stability. These issues were, however, not really present in purpose-built light carrier designs. The light fleet carriers would prove to be so successful that ships intended for a few years of service would last until the dawn of the 21st century, at least in a couple cases. And that's in active service, not as museum ships. While the cruiser conversions would prove nowhere near that long-lived, with one notable exception, even these ships, for whatever flaws they had, were worth the work put into them. They gave good service and would, in some cases, see at least some useful post-war service in other navies. Really, be they be purpose-built or conversions, light carriers would prove to be valuable and long-lived ships, particularly for smaller navies that couldn't afford fleet carriers, but still wanted that blue water aviation capability. Before all that, though, I suppose I should look at the earliest designs of the type. While not inherently intended as a light carrier, by the time World War II rolled around, ships such as HMS Hermes or the Japanese Hosho would be considered such. Experimental carriers that had been built before anyone was really sure what an aircraft carrier would actually be. As such, they weren't particularly large or capable ships, especially in the case of Hosho. While generally considered a light carrier in later documentation, she was always an experimental kind of ship, and her air wing was, let's say, reflective of this. Even when she was an active combatant, she could manage perhaps 15 or so aircraft, of the smaller 1920s and 1930s designs. Hosho was thus less a light carrier and more an experimental training ship, for all that she would see some combat duty against China and in secondary roles early in the Pacific War. Hermes, meanwhile, was a more capable carrier, though not by a large margin. Similarly to Hosho, she had been designed and built when no one was sure of what a carrier was going to be. She was small and relatively slow, meant as much for testing a purpose-built carrier as for actual combat operations. It's notable here that her design began with the full intention to be a seaplane carrier as much as a regular one. That she stuck around long enough to be reclassed in historical documentation as a light carrier is due entirely to treaties. The Royal Navy had her, she was still capable of operating such things as swordfish on remote stations, so why not keep her around? The thing about these two ships is that, yes, they're light carriers, insofar as they're small carriers. But they weren't designed to be light carriers. Retroactively considered such, but not designed in that regard. The first ship I'd argue to be intended as a light carrier is probably the Japanese Ryujo, in the sense of being a carrier intentionally built light and smaller than a full-on fleet carrier, in comparison to the standard of the time, while still being intended to operate as a proper combat carrier. Her design is, of course, somewhat hampered by the fact she was built as a totally not a carrier honest to try and loophole the Washington Treaty. Because of that, she would suffer from various issues in service, stability issues being the most prominent, but her small size, especially her elevators, would also prevent her from operating modern aircraft. That being said, in comparison to her predecessor in Hosho, Ryujo was at least fully intended to be a combat warship, and did well enough in the role. At least in the early war. While I'm on the topic, I suppose I can stick with Japan and their various light carrier ideas. While Ryujo is the only purpose-built light carrier here, Japan would have several various tenders that they could rapidly convert into light carriers. 
This was, much like the aforementioned carrier, to try and circumvent treaty restrictions. The resultant ships, be they Zuiho or Chitose class, were fully capable carriers, albeit that the latter class finished their conversion after Japan didn't really have pilots for them. Regardless, these ships were, while a tad slower, capable of operating similar numbers of aircraft to the American-like carriers, and proved to be quite useful ships to have in the long run. They operated on what would become the classic light carrier doctrine, as support ships for the big carriers, or, when it was necessary, in place of those carriers when you need a mobile airfield, but can't split off one of the larger and more valuable flattops. You see this quite clearly with Shoho and Zuiho in the early war, though these ships would often also play aircraft ferry later on. Finally for Japan, there was an attempt to convert the incomplete heavy cruiser Ibuki into an aircraft carrier, somewhat akin to the American cruiser conversions. She ended the war almost 80% complete, though by then she would have been of little use even had she been completed, because again, by that point Japan didn't really have pilots for carriers. With that, we can move from Japan to the United States now. This is an interesting one. While there's the obvious case of the Independence class carriers, the United States Navy would flirt on and off with the idea for a long time. The 1920s and 1930s were a wacky time for the Navy. Such concepts as the flight deck cruiser proliferated because no one was quite sure if fewer big carriers or larger numbers of smaller ships was the better idea. The real answer was probably a mix of the two, using fleet carriers as fleet carriers and the smaller ships for such things as anti-submarine warfare, which was at least recognized in the late 1930s for such small carrier designs. It is, after all, what the escort carriers did in World War II, and what the Essexes did when they were alight in comparison to the behemoths that replaced them, and other such things like that. In any event, be they wacky designs like the flight deck cruisers, which were carriers with cruiser turrets, or more traditional small carriers, one thing was in common. These were intended to give more flight decks and a wider spread of ships. You see a similar argument crop up with Ranger and the Yorktowns. The argument that if you have more hulls, you can afford to eat damage, or even losses, while not losing overall effectiveness. The Navy would, in the end, realize that the relative lack of capability of smaller and lighter carriers made any hypothetical numbers advantage rather moot, at least for the task of engaging other aircraft carriers. None of these 1920s or 1930s concepts would be built, and the smallest purpose-built carriers would remain Ranger and Wasp, which are, for their part, fleet carriers, admittedly on the smaller and less capable end, especially with Ranger, but doctrinally and design-wise, they're still fleet carriers. However, it is not where the story of American light carriers ends. After all, President Roosevelt had latched onto the idea and pushed hard for it. Specifically, he had latched onto the idea that one could take cruisers and quickly convert them into functional aircraft carriers in order to get ships into the water faster than the Essex class. The Navy was resistant, pointing out that such small carriers were not as capable as larger ships and riddled with compromises. Roosevelt would push through another design study showing that the idea was viable, in theory, but the Navy still didn't really want to do it. Only for the attack on Pearl Harbor to bring it right back up. That second design study was in October of 1941. Fast forward a few months, and come early 1942, cruiser conversions were definitely a thing the Navy actually wanted now. This would take the form of the Independence class, which, as mentioned at the start of the video, came with certain problems. Primarily with their cruiser lines making them fairly slim carriers, with all the issues that implies with landing or aircraft storage. Nonetheless, they made effective carriers in practice, though as it would turn out, their entire purpose was somewhat flawed. That is, the idea that one could take cruiser hulls and get them into the water as carriers faster than you could build the big Essexes. While it was true enough that these ships could be built quickly, the converted light carriers would end up coming into service when the first of the Essex class did as well. A couple pertinent examples here, chosen at random from the respective classes. 
First off, USS Langley CVL-27. She was laid down on April 11, 1942. She entered the water about a year later, on May 22, 1943, and she was commissioned August of the same year. That's a pretty fast turnaround. But the thing is, look at USS Hornet CV-12. She was laid down on August 3, 1942. She was launched almost exactly a year later, on August 30, 1943, and commissioned on November 23, 1943. While Hornet is one of the fastest of the Essex class to be built, by no means is she an extreme outlier. It took her only a year from keel laying to entering service, though it would be early 1944 before she joined the war. As it would turn out, with American industry ramping up, an Essex could be built roughly as fast as an Independence, though on average the CVs were still slightly slower to build and enter service. Which makes the real advantage to the light carriers here that they entered service in mid to late 1943, while most of the Essex Swarm would not enter service until 1944 or later. Regardless, while they may not have been that much faster to enter service, the light carriers were joining the war at a time when the Navy really did need every single carrier it could get. Coupled with the fact that they could be built by smaller yards than the big fleet carriers, one can see that Roosevelt's idea had certain merit. These ships couldn't do everything a fleet carrier could, but what they could do was handle lighter duty that escort carriers couldn't do and operate with the big carriers when needed. Moreover, the flaws with the Independence design were recognized, and that led to the decision to build two more CVLs from the ground up instead of as converted hulls. These were the Saipan class, built upon the design of the larger Baltimore class heavy cruiser, though they were new builds, not conversions of existing hulls. Though part of the reason for their existence was actually somewhat pessimistic, albeit it was realistic pessimism. It was fully expected that the Independence-class ships would see losses. The two Saipans were ordered explicitly with the idea that two of the older CVLs would be lost, and these new ships would bring the total of light carriers back up to nine in all. As it would turn out, only Princeton was lost, and the Saipans were completed too late for the war in any event. Right, with that done, what of post-war service? Well, the two Saipans would largely miss the chance to serve as proper carriers. They operated as such for about a decade, from the late 1940s to the late 1950s. Both would miss service in the Korean War, and as jets became big enough that even the Essex class was considered small and cramped, it shouldn't be a surprise that the Saipans were converted away from carrier duty to be a communication ship and command ship, respectively. They would last in these roles until 1970, ultimately being scrapped by the start of the 1980s. The older Independence-class ships would see longer service as carriers, albeit not with the United States Navy, where the last was decommissioned by the late 1950s. However, Bellow Wood, Langley, and Cabot would see service with foreign navies, the first two with France and Cabot with Spain. The two French transfers would give good service, albeit only in colonial conflicts, before being decommissioned themselves by the early 1960s. It would be Cabot in Spanish service that lasted the longest of the American light carriers. Her story really deserves a video of its own, but for now, I'll say this. She was loaned to the Spanish Navy in 1967, after 12 years in mothballs. That loan was changed to an outright sale in 1972, by which point she had already outlived her sisters. She would ultimately serve in the Spanish fleet until 1989, outliving the Saipans in turn, and only be scrapped in 2002. Most impressively, while in Spanish service, the old light carrier would be the first carrier to routinely operate Harriers, which is something that President Roosevelt could hardly have imagined when he was pushing for these conversions. With that, we're out of the World War II era light carriers that were actually completed, with the exception of the British light fleet carriers. Germany attempted to convert a heavy cruiser, but they didn't finish. Italy considered converting a crippled heavy cruiser of their own into something resembling the American flight deck cruiser idea, but that also went nowhere. As for the light fleet carriers, I intend to cover those at a later date. As the name light fleet carrier suggests, 
these are in something of a weird middle ground. They're larger and more capable than the Independence class, in fact capable of carrying an air wing not far off in Illustrious. These ships were also able to lend themselves far more easily to modernization, becoming a key feature of not just the Royal Navy, but several foreign fleets as well. So successful would these ships prove to be as small fleet carriers, that as mentioned at the start of the video, a couple would last right up to the dawn of the 21st century. Not bad for emergency builds, intended to last about three years. That being said, Britain's flirting with the concept would eventually culminate in the Invincible class carriers, which were initially called Through Deck Cruisers, which, fair enough, they originated from cruiser studies and were intended for more traditional cruiser roles. Still, by the time they actually entered service, they were recognized as light carriers. A role that would see one of them, Illustrious, last until 2014. But with that, we come to the end. To wrap the video up, I'll say this. Light carriers of the interwar and World War II period were intended as cheaper options or emergency builds, depending on exactly what you're looking at. They gave good service as such, lasting far longer than anyone could reasonably have expected in a couple cases. But in the modern day, while they've largely vanished from history, some do remain. Most notably, perhaps, in the Italian Navy of all places, with Garibaldi and Cavour. Recently, Turkey joined the still somewhat exclusive club of home-built aircraft carriers with what can be considered the first drone carrier. And, of course, there's always Japan with their not-an-aircraft-carrier-we-swear destroyers. Thank you for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed the content, and I'll see you in the next one.